I'm Harriet Vanceball, cardiologist and clinical trialist, and I'm so delighted to be here with my friend, Dr. Aaron Vahula from the Timmy Study Group. And we are here to discuss her exciting, late-breaking presentation at AHA 2025 on the Vesalius trial. Welcome, Erin. Thanks so much for having me, Harriet. Um, tell us a little bit about the context, Erin. Why was this trial executed? Give us a little bit about the background data and the yep. current guidelines that shape the care of patients who are at risk of cardiovascular events. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the sort of basis for this is that we know that, that LDL cholesterol is a modifiable risk factor. Um, and, you know, we have data from other seminal trials with PCSK9 inhibitors that use of those agents actually improve cardiovascular outcom outcomes in patients who've had a prior Meyer stroke. Um, but what we didn't know is whether or not PCSK9 inhibition is helpful from a cardiovascular perspective, not just LDL lowering, but to prevent outcomes um, in patients who haven't had a prior Meyer stroke. So sort of taking it down in terms of the risk profile, um, which was really then set the stage in the context for the Vesalius study. And I'll say, you know, guidelines obviously vary in terms of their recommendations, but, but you know, there is certainly a move towards pr pr uh, treating these people very aggressively. Um, but, but I think it was important for us to sort of provide the, the evidence that there really is cardiovascular benefit Sure. And so much of our care is limited, um, not just because of clinician factors, but also appearance on the side of the patient. So when we talk about your intervention, there's potential not only to reduce risk, but potentially to enhance appearance to therapies. Would you like to comment on that quickly? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think it, um, I think when we look in clinical practice in multiple registries, I think, you know, patients are undertreated and I think there's a lot that goes into that. I think there's health systems issues. I think there's patient reluctance. Um, and I think if we can provide more data that there's benefit, I hopefully we can encourage the patients, um, you know, to really believe in this and to move forward with treatment. You know, obviously it's to their benefit. So what was the target population that you aimed to intervene on? Yeah. Um, so again, we were looking at patients who had not had a prior MI or stroke. So uh, more specifically, high cardiovascular risk without a prior MI or stroke. And, and so what that meant for our inclusion um, was patients had to have at least one of the following. So they had to have coronary disease without a prior MI, uh, cerebrovascular disease without a prior stroke, uh, peripheral artery disease, or high-risk diabetes, um, which we defined as, as patients who either were using insulin, who'd had a long diagnosis of, of diabetes, about 10 years, um, or had evidence of, of microvascular disease. And then these patients had to have evidence of elevated lipids with an LDL of at least 90 milligrams per deciliter, and there were a few other lipid criteria. Um, and then we also encouraged people to be on aggressive background lipid-lowering therapy. Um, and so this was really the trial population. So to kind of sum it up, it's patients who have atherosclerosis without a prior event or patients who have high-risk diabetes with no known atherosclerosis. Okay. So tell us about your trial design. It was a one-to-one -one randomization. That's right. And um, tell us about the dosing. Yeah. Ever so. Yeah, so, um, so it was one-to-one -one randomization. People were... were um, uh, randomized to placebo or evolocumab, dosed every two weeks, kind of standard standard dosing for that. Um, and then they were followed, um, importantly, for a pretty long duration. The median duration was about 4.6 years. Um, and they were followed for a dual primary endpoints. And um, there was one that was a three-point MACE composite, which was coronary heart disease death, MI, or ischemic stroke. And then there was a second one which was a four-point composite, which had all three of those elements plus ischemia-driven arterial revascularization, and that was revascularization in any any uh, vascular bed. Okay, and did you split your alpha and huh? We did. We split our alpha, and we had sort of a, a formal um, uh, testing hypothesis, sort of sequential testing, where um, we tested both of those primary endpoints, and if they were both significant, then we could pass that alpha on uh, down to a number of key secondary endpoints, um, which included additional composites and then individual endpoints like MI, the various types of death. Um, Tell us about your patient population. What were the baseline characteristics yeah, like? Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, so we had in total about 12,000 patients, 12,257. 
Um, and you know, they were, they were balanced between the treatment arms, no differences there. Um, average age was fairly typical for a cardiovascular outcomes trial, 66 years. 43% um, were women, which I think is actually well represented um, in this type of trial. Um, the majority were white, which kind of reflects where we recruited patients. Um, two thirds had atherosclerosis. Um, about half had high risk diabetes and a third had high risk diabetes without atherosclerosis. Um, and then in terms of their background treatment, um, 72% were on a high intensity lipid lowering regimen. So that's a regimen that would be expected to drop LDL by 50% or more. 68% were on a high intensity statin and then 20% were on azetamide. Um, and the LDL at baseline was at 122 milligrams per deciliter, um, which sort of reflects our, our higher inclusion uh, criteria for the lipids. Okay, tell us your primary treatment effect. Nice. So we had, we, we saw um, a 25% uh, relative risk reduction in that three-point MACE composite, um, you know, which was, which was quite significant in terms of the statistical testing, and then a 19% relative risk reduction in the four-point MACE composite. That's, that's transformative. No. Um, and then what about your confirmatory endpoints? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, we could pass our alpha at this point because we met significance for both of them down to the key secondaries. Um, a number of them that we had, um, one that I'll highlight is the, the sort of traditional composite of CV death, MI, and stroke. It was a 27% reduction in that. Um, for MI, we had a 64% reduction. For revascularization, it was about a 21% reduction. Um, where the testing stopped was at coronary heart disease death. So the hazard ratio there was 0.89, but the upper bound of the confidence interval was above one. Um, but we did continue on and do testing for the remainder of the endpoints, although they have to be sort of considered exploratory. Um, but what we saw was a hazard ratio of um, 0.79 for CB death and 0.80 for all-cause mortality. And the nominal p-value for all-cause mortality was 0 0.0005. So um, you know, sort of exploratory, but, but uh, you know, interesting for sure. Tell us about the safety of this drug. Yeah, so, so we, I will say, um, there's a lot of experience with this medication, um, including from the Fourier study, which was 20, 27,000 patients followed for over two years. And, and what Fourier identified was really the, the major side effect that people complained of was injection site reaction, so really not much else. Um, and here we had, we had sort of more limited uh, review of safety, um, but we didn't identify any, any you know, sort of uh, differences in safety signals between the arms. And in terms of efficacy, were your subgroup analyses suggestive of consistent treatment effect of your subgroup? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so for we, we um, you know, have, we looked at both the three-point and the four-point MACE composite for the subgroups, and there was definitely consistency. And there was consistency by age, by gender, by baseline LDL, by statin intensity, by use of azetamibe. And I think the one that's sort of the, the most interesting to highlight is there was consistency when you looked in people who had qualifying atherosclerosis as well as in patients who just had diabetes without qualifying atherosclerosis. So in that, you know, patients with ASCVD as well as patients without known ASCVD. Right, and so, um... What was the reduction in LDL and were there any improvements in some of the other um, markers? Yeah. Uh, uh, any of the other surrogate markers that... Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, so the LDL, we, we had a lipid sub-study in about 2,000 patients. And in that sub-study, the baseline LDL was 115 milligrams per deciliter. And that in the evolocumab arm dropped to a median of 45 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and that was kind of maintained throughout the duration of the study. So that was about a 55% reduction uh, or an absolute reduction of a little bit over 60 milligrams per deciliter, um, which is very much on sort of the, the percent reduction is what we've seen in the past. We kind of know that that's what this, this drug does, but there was a, you know, a large absolute reduction and to your question about other lipid parameters, we saw a little over 40% reduction in ApoB. I think it was maybe a 27% reduction in LP little a. Um, so kind of consistent with, with what we have seen previously, but replicated here. Okay, so I know the guideline committees will meet and, and, and give it a, a, an indication uh, based on the strength of uh, your trial. 
what do you think we need to do to start implementing some of this evidence? Because we know that this is an asymptomatic condition. Mm -hmm. uh, Hyperclustering anemia. Uh, it's under recognized as a risk factor. Risk accumulates over time. This is something actionable that we could change to move the needle on the burden of cardiovascular disease. So what are some of the strategies or what are your thoughts on what can be done to implement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. You know, I think having the data, it, it hopefully, will be very powerful. Um, I think that one of the take-homes for me is that we just need to be much more aggressive within a lower-risk population, right? And I think we need to start treating people earlier. Um, and so I think, you know, hopefully having this represented in the guidelines and, and, you know, making sure that people are kind of aware of the data so providers are aware of the data, having the providers communicate that to patients. And, you know, I think access is really important too. And and so making sure that, you know, and I think access becomes easier when you have data, right? That I think generally the whole system, uh, you know, is, is a little bit more, um, well, it's easier to work with when there's data supporting. Um, right. You know. Any cost effect of this analysis plan? <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're definitely considering, we, we would love to do that. So that is part of, I think that is part of the plan. You know, and it's, and it's, it's um, you know, it was, the, the, as you highlighted, I mean, these were, these are pretty powerful, you know, results. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see, you know, that the, the sort of positive cost, cost effectiveness out of this. Fantastic. And any other plans aside from cost effectiveness analysis? I'm sure there'll be a lot of secondary analyses yeah. and cools analyses. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, we, we've got a very long list of things that we want to look in. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is an interesting trial. I've sort of highlighted that it's multiple populations that are included in this trial. So we'll start digging into those populations. You know, we'll look at different endpoints and try to understand the benefits there. Um, so a lot, lots to do. You'll hear a lot more from us um, in, in the coming months, years. So fantastic. Well, congratulations on the trial. And it's always a treat for me to see you succeed and shine. And so I'm really exceptionally delighted to be sitting there with you, Eric. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful.